Good morning, everyone. I am really excited to be here with you today and to talk about humans and how we can study humans and study them in attack scenarios without actually hurting humans, because, you know, hurting people is bad. Uh, so let's talk about humans, and I want to start with a quote about humans from a pretty famous computer security textbook. So it says, humans are incapable of securely storing high quality cryptographic keys, and they have unacceptable speed and accuracy when performing cryptographic operations. But they are sufficiently pervasive that we must design our protocols around their limitations. And that part that I've highlighted, that's really important. We can't just say, oh, well, those humans. We really need to figure out how to make our security protocols actually work with humans, the way humans work. So it's important to think about what is the threat that humans pose to secure systems. Now, usually in computer security, when we talk about human threats, we are talking about malicious humans, right? We're talking about the attackers who are trying to get into our systems and alter our data and snoop on things they're not supposed to look at, right? But those are not the only kinds of human threats that we need to worry about. They're also clueless humans, and they can be a big threat to a secure system. So the clueless humans aren't even aware that there are security protocols they're supposed to be following. They, they don't understand what it is they're supposed to be doing. They're not malicious, they're just clueless. Then there are those unmotivated or lazy humans. Those humans might actually know what it is they're supposed to be doing, but they're lazy, they're too busy, or maybe they're spending their time doing their job, which has nothing to do with security. They're working on making more widgets, making more money for their company, and security is something that would just get in the way, and so they're not motivated to spend time doing security. And then we have those humans who are constrained by human limitations. And, you know, I think that's all of us. Uh, we have a lot of security tasks that we ask of people that are actually really hard. You know, trying to uh, memorize all of those long, unique passwords, it's not really a lot of fun. Uh, when I was in an elementary school, I used to dread spelling tests. And trying to memorize my passwords is like memorizing those spelling words. And so I think there's a lot of things that we have to think about and realize, hey, we're not actually asking people to do something that's particularly reasonable to ask them to do. So given all of this, we like to conduct user studies to help us better understand what it is that humans can and can't do and how they're going to respond to different situations. And this will help us build better systems. So let's talk about some reasons why I think it makes sense to conduct security user studies. The first reason is to help us assess needs. So this is often done at the beginning of a project. We want to understand what would be useful to humans, what are the needs that they actually have, so we can develop the requirements for our system. Another reason to conduct user studies is to examine trade-offs. So we might have ideas for a bunch of features. We might uh, realize that there are some features that are going to be more usable than others, and some are going to be more secure than others. And we need to figure out what, what's in, what's out. And um, doing a user study is going to help us better understand those trade-offs and make an informed decision rather than just speculating. We might also conduct a user study in order to evaluate a prototype or existing system so that we can understand what's working, what's not working, um, and then hopefully address the things that are not working. And finally, we might conduct a user study to help us find root causes of problems. We may know we have a problem. We may know that Johnny can't encrypt. But what we don't understand is why we have this problem. And so a user study can help us understand exactly what is going wrong and why, and hopefully help us fix our system. 
All right, so I just gave you a lot of good reasons to do user studies, but there are a lot of excuses for not doing user studies. Um, and so I want to share some of them with you. If people weren't so lazy or stupid or clueless, it would work just fine. You know, it's not the problem of the system, it's those users. Um, and of course, by now, you know, we're only a few minutes into the talk, but you know that I don't share that view. You know, we have to do something about the system to help it work for the users. Another excuse, I already know what people want. I designed this system, I built the system, I used the system. I know what I want and that's what everybody else should want. No time, no money. And unfortunately, this is often the case with secure systems, that when we budget to develop a system, we often forget about the usability piece. And so there's no budget set aside for doing user studies. There's no time left in the development life cycle and the time frame in order to do those user studies. So I want to encourage you to try to intervene early and make sure that we leave time and budget to do this. And I also want to emphasize that while you could certainly do a very long and time consuming user study, there are opportunities to do much more lightweight user studies that don't have to be very expensive or time consuming. And that's really going to be better than not doing any user study at all if your resources are limited. Next excuse, I find the system easy to use. So you should too, right? Or my kids find it easy to use. And um, you know, this is my son when he was two. He's 16 now. You can see he started using computers at a very early age. And so the fact that he finds a system easy to use is not necessarily indicative that anybody else will find it easy to use. And finally, I'm not a usability expert. I'm a cryptographer. Okay, so I don't really want cryptographers and security experts who are not trained on usability to be the ones in charge of doing usability studies. I, I get that. But I think it makes a lot of sense for security experts to collaborate on usability studies with people who do know how to do them. And I think in the usable security area, it's especially important that security professionals be part of the design of these studies. And the reason is, is that these studies are a bit different than the kinds of user studies that are often done in other areas. So, you know, take an example. Let's say we were building a word processor. How would we do a user study? Well, we might invite people into our lab and have them type a document, maybe insert a table, change the font, do a spell check. Um, that's pretty straightforward. But if this were a security user study, we would be in there deleting all their characters as they were typing them and seeing if they could still write that document. Right? We have to have an attacker to have a user study in the security area that actually makes sense under realistic conditions. And trying to figure out how to insert that attack, that threat model into the user study is why we need to have partnerships with our security professionals and our usability professionals. So when we do a security user study, we're trying to make sure not only that the system is usable, but also that it remains secure when we have uh, users who are, uh, who are under attack, where we have attackers who are trying to fool the users, when we have users who behave in predictable ways that our attackers can predict, and when we have users who may be lazy, unmotivated, careless, stressed, or just really busy using the system. Another important thing to realize is that security is typically a secondary task. So while security professionals may buy a computer specifically to do security, most other people don't do that. Most people buy computers to do their work or for entertainment, playing games, sending emails, surfing the web, not to do security. 
And in fact, they try not to do security. Uh, any security tasks that they do are only because they really, really think they have to. Someone's forcing them to, uh, you know, the, the, the pop-up won't go away until they attend to it or something along those lines. Um, and so this uh, poses a challenge for studying security. A few challenges that I want to highlight here. One is when we do a usable security study, it's important that we make it as realistic as possible. Um, but it's, it's actually difficult to set up a scenario that's kind of this hypothetical scenario that really feels like the way the user actually behaves when they're using their computer and software. We also need to be able to observe risky events. And those risky events often are kind of uh, infrequent. We don't really see them popping up all the time. And so we need to find a way to observe these infrequent events um, in the course of our study. And then there are all sorts of legal, ethical, and practical issues that arise when you try to do a security user study. So, how can we design a legal and ethical study that allows us to observe users in realistic scenarios being exposed to risk? Well, I'm going to talk about three different approaches that we've used in our lab at Carnegie Mellon, um, and I'm going to tell you about some examples of how we did these studies. Um, I'm going to go through them very quickly, but if you're interested in hearing more about them, there are papers on most of these studies that are available on my lab's website, and you can check that out. So the first type of study is to observe real world activity. So in this case, we have some type of secure system or security activity we'd like to observe, and we need to find a bunch of users that we can look over their shoulder or instrument their computers or software so we can gather data about how they do this activity. In this case, it's real users, real activity, and whatever real risk they're actually exposed to in the real world. Um, so this, this is great if you can get it. Um, but there are many challenges with this sort of study. It's not always easy to look over users' shoulders, either literally or virtually. Uh, we don't always have those populations of users available to us. It's also uh, usually difficult to do a controlled experiment this way. Uh, the users come with whatever software they have. Now, sometimes if, if you're a big company and you have a big user base, you might be able to do some A-B testing where you distribute different versions to different users. Um, and then that, that's a great luxury to be able to do that kind of study. Um, but for uh, us academics and for others, it, it may not be feasible always to do that kind of a study. Um, and then finally, another uh, concern with this sort of study is, again, those risky events may not be all that frequent. And so it may be difficult to, to catch them. And so we, we may have to observe users over a long period of time. All right, so another approach is to observe hypothetical security tasks. So here, we bring users into our lab, or we recruit them for an online study, and we give them a security task and a hypothetical scenario, and we say, okay, we're gonna watch you do this. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you about a study, for example, where we watch people create passwords. Um, in this case, we need to have some risk, um, and so ideally, we would add some risk to, to the scenario. Um, but it's really important that it not be real risk. We can't actually harm users who are part of our user study. So instead, we come up with some simulated risk that we can apply to our scenario. Um, and we want it to feel as real as possible. We would like the users to believe that the risk is real. Um, and so usually we have to use some deception. We may need to lie to our users about what's actually going on. And then at the end of the study, we come clean. We tell them what was real and what was fake um, so, so that they don't walk away you know, worried that they actually did undergo some, some uh, hazard. 
Um, so one, one issue that we, we have here though is that we have given users a hypothetical security scenario. So they know that this is about security and they may be more alert to security than they otherwise normally would. So another approach is to recruit users and instead of giving them a security task, we recruit users to do some completely unrelated tasks such as online shopping. And um, they come in thinking they're doing a study about online shopping or whatever it is and then we insert that simulated risk in the middle of that task. And so when that risky situation pops up, they don't, they're not already attuned to security and the risk and we can watch more naturally what they do to address that risk. Now in this case, users are still doing a task that they were asked to do as part of the study. Um, and so that, that is a drawback. But if we come up with realistic enough tasks that are similar enough to the kinds of tasks that users actually do, this can be a pretty good way to collect data. Okay, so I just outlined three approaches and now I'm going to talk about two studies that we've done at Carnegie Mellon that actually have used these three different approaches. So we're going to start with observation of real world activity with naturally occurring risk. So the first study is uh, one that's actually in progress right now, uh, so we only have preliminary results, but we are observing the rollout of two-factor authentication at our university. So this past spring, the university started rolling out a two-factor authentication solution that uses either a smartphone or a token, and they required university employees to adopt it. For students who were not employees, it was optional as to whether they adopted it or not. So we started uh, collecting data, uh, we started with surveys of both um, the employees as well as the students to understand uh, their attitudes about it and why they were choosing to adopt it or not adopt it and what kinds of problems they were having. We also uh, started collecting data from the campus help desk to understand what kind of problems they were observing. Um, and also looking at the rate of security incidences that were related to having uh, two-factor or not having two-factor. So this data collection is still underway, but we do have some preliminary results that I can mention. So we're already starting to get some good insights as to why people who don't have to adopt it are choosing to adopt it. Um, a really big issue is their beliefs about what they have to protect. We have some people who say, you know, I'm just a student, I don't have anything in my account that anyone cares about, why should I bother doing this extra thing to protect the security of my account? On the other hand, we have other students who say, yes, I have stuff I want to protect, I don't want people getting into my account, so it's worth it to me to start using two-factor. Um, we also hear a lot about concerns about the extra time and effort it might take. And the more concerned about, about it that people are, the more they're worried that it will take a lot of time, the less likely they are to voluntarily adopt. Um, there's also similarly concerns about not having their phone or their token when they need it. Uh, and then that would cause them not to be able to access critical resources, including in some cases their dorm room. Um, and so those concerns are driving lack of adoption. And then finally, uh, we find it actually matters what they know about other people who have adopted. So people who say, oh, my friend has it and got locked out of their dorm room, they're much less likely to want to adopt it themselves. Whereas people who say, oh, my friend has it and says it's really easy, they're much more likely to go ahead and adopt. We've been able to observe some interesting usability problems as well as some unintended consequences of this two-factor system. So we have seen that it's very common for people not to have their phones with them. Um, this is especially true for our faculty and staff. Um, students are more likely to be glued to their phones. Um, and, and so when people don't have the phone, they're locked out of their accounts. 
Um, when the students don't have their phone, when that happens, they may be locked out of their dorm rooms. Um, and previously, you could get a friend or someone down the hall to help you get into your room. Now, you really can't do anything except call campus police. Um, and so that's more of a problem. And then another issue that we've seen is that token, and there's a picture of the token. It has a green button, and if that's in your pocket or in your purse, it, you, accidental button pushes happen all the time. And too many accidental button pushes and the token gets out of sync. Uh, this seems like a problem we shouldn't be having in 2017. We've had these kinds of devices for a long time. We should know how to build these hardware tokens so that they don't suffer this problem, but apparently we don't. Um, and that, that's a, a problem that we need to work on. Right, the next study that I want to talk about is also an observational study. Um, and this is a, a study that, um, that we've been doing to observe home computer users. So we have something at Carnegie Mellon called the Security Behavior Observatory. And we've been recruiting home computer users to put our software on their computer, and it will send us uh, regularly lots and lots of data, mostly about the security and privacy-related behaviors that, that they have. These are all Windows computers. Um, we currently have about 200 people who are actively sending us data. Um, and this uh, allows us to observe a lot of interesting behavior. And then we periodically supplement our observations by sending people uh, written surveys as well as doing phone interviews with them uh, so that we get some of the why behind the, the behavior that we're observing. So one of the studies that we did and we wrote a paper on here was to look at the impact on security engagement. We had a hypothesis that users who were spending time maintaining their computers would have better security states on their computers. So that means you know, less malware, uh, less unpatched uh, software on their computers. But what we actually found is that there was not necessarily a direct correlation between user engagement and security state. In fact, we found that there were people who were very engaged but were doing completely the wrong things. Uh, we also found that there are people who were not very engaged, but they also hardly used their computers, and so they were not actually exposed to very much risk. More recently, we've been looking at the password behaviors of users in our security behavior observatory. And so we've been collecting hashes of their passwords. We don't actually want their real passwords. So we have hashes of their passwords, as well as hashes of substrings of their passwords. And we have measures of length and strength and how many different types of character classes are in their passwords. And we have some really interesting data here. So these bars, each one represents one user. And these are the 20 users that we have the most password data from, or at least about two months ago. This is what, what, what we had from them. We have a lot more data now. Um, and what we've done is we've color coded the level of reuse of passwords that these users have. So the green bit are the passwords that are not being reused at all. And the orange bit are partially reused. So they might have you know, five characters that are common between two passwords, and then they tack on two or three on the end that are unique. Um, red are exactly reused passwords. And pink are passwords that are both partially reused and exactly reused. So what you can see is the green area is really small. People don't have very many passwords that they are not reusing. Um, that reuse is, is totally rampant um, and very much widespread here. And we think this is really an interesting finding. Let's move on now and talk about some hypothetical security tasks. And we will continue talking about passwords and talk about some of the studies that we've been doing uh, with hypothetical security tasks related to password policies. So we started off with the question of how we can help users pick passwords that are going to be both secure and usable for them. We started doing some large-scale online experiments on passwords about six years ago. We've been using Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which for those of you who aren't familiar, is a great platform where you can recruit people to do short tasks and pay them 10 cents or 50 cents or a dollar or two to complete your task. And Amazon handles all of the payments for you. You just 
give Amazon a credit card number and, um, and you're ready to go. So we've been able to recruit over 50,000 people to do this study um, over the past several years. We're also able to email all of these people without us actually collecting their email address or any personally identifiable information because we, we contact them through Amazon. So in this study, we, and this is a series of studies, but they all start out basically the same, uh, we give people the task of creating a password under a randomly assigned password policy condition. Uh, then they take a survey, and then they recall the password, and then two days later, we contact them and ask them to try to log in again, remembering their password, and take another survey. So uh, we start off with a hypothetical security scenario, which includes risk. Uh, so here's a typical scenario that we give. Imagine that your main email service provider has been attacked and your account became compromised. You need to create a new password for your email account since your old password may be known by the attackers. Because of the attack, your email service provider is also changing its password rules. All right, so then we give them the task. Please follow the instructions below to create a new password for your email account. We will ask you to use this password for a few days to, in a few days to log in again, so it is important that you remember your new password. And then we give them their particular password policy that they have to follow. And then finally, we remind them that we want them to behave normally. Please take the steps you would normally take to remember your email password and protect this password as you normally would protect the password for your email account. Please behave as, as you would if this were your real password. So we don't tell them whether they should write it down or not write it down or anything. We just tell them, do what you normally do. Later in the survey, we do ask them whether they wrote it down, and we also check to see if it seems that their password was cut and pasted in or auto-filled in as well. Right. We have a number of usability metrics that we collect. Uh, so we, we collect how long it took them to create the password, how many attempts it took. Uh, we also look at how many attempts it took to recall the password. Um, we ask them some questions about how fun, difficult, annoying this process was. Uh, we also uh, are, are collecting data on whether they've written down their password or stored it. And then we also look at study dropout rates because we found that the, um, the more difficult it is, the more likely they are to drop out of the study and not actually finish it. We also look at password strength metrics. Uh, and um, so here, the main metrics that we focus on is guessability. And guessability is our estimate of how many guesses it would take a sophisticated attacker to guess that password. Uh, and we've developed tools that, um, that basically simulate what sophisticated attackers are doing and come up with that estimate of password strength for every password that is created in our study. Now we run this study with lots of different password policies, and I only have time to tell you about a few of our basic ones. Uh, so we have the basic eight policy, which is anything you want as long as it's at least eight characters long. The dictionary eight, which is same thing, except it can't be in a dictionary. Comprehensive eight, it must be at least eight characters long, not in a dictionary, and have an uppercase, lowercase, digit, and symbol. So this is a pretty common password policy. And basic 16 is anything you want, except it has to be at least 16 characters long. And we have lots of other policies that we've tested. So this is an example of what some of our results look like. So here you can see there's a line representing each password policy that we tested in this particular study. And along the x-axis, you see the number of guesses. Um, and uh, on the y-axis, what percentage of passwords were cracked after that number of guesses? So the lines near the bottom are the better policies, because after many guesses, a small number of passwords uh, were actually guessed. So we can see here that Comprehensive 8 and Basic 16 seem to be the best password policies in this particular test, at least according to strength. But we need to look at usability too. So let's look at some of our usability data. For example, here we asked the question about how annoying it was to create this password. 
And um, you can see here that Comprehensive 8 and Basic 16, which were our strongest password policies, are also, unfortunately, our most annoying password policies. And we also asked them how difficult it was, and we see the same thing for difficulty. But there's actually a significant difference between Comprehensive 8 and Basic 16. So if you're trying to balance security and usability, you'd be much better off with Basic 16 than Comprehensive 8 uh, because we do have significantly better usability metrics and we see that on a bunch of other usability metrics we looked at as well. This particular experimental approach has been very useful to us and it allows us to look at the relative strength and relative usability of lots of different policies. We're able to do nice controlled experiments where we can change one thing and hold everything else constant. So, you know, we went back and we said, okay, basic 16 is good. What about basic 12? What about basic 20? We're able to do those side by side comparisons. We also can observe everything that the user is typing while they're doing the study. So we have all of their keystrokes, including their use of the delete key, um, which also provides a lot of insights to us. Now, we were concerned that this was a hypothetical scenario and that maybe the data that we're getting is not all that indicative of what users would really do. Uh, so we did do a study where we were able to compare this with real password data obtained from our university. And we found that actually users are behaving fairly naturally in this study. Um, so that was good news. All right, now I'd like to tell you about a study where we looked at how well users can compare crypto key fingerprints. There are a bunch of apps uh, for secure messaging and they require that if you want to send a secure message to someone, you have to know their public key and you have to make sure you have the public key for the right person, otherwise someone else is going to receive that secure message. So a public key looks something like this, it's actually much longer than that, and if you wanted to ask someone, do I have your public key, it would be pretty um, inconvenient to read all of that off. So fortunately, we have fingerprints, which are much smaller representations of those keys. And the original idea was, well, that's, that's pretty short, you can call someone up and read off that short little fingerprint and make sure you have the right key. Um, and here's a scenario, Alice wants to verify Bob's fingerprint and the app itself has the fingerprint on it and, um, and then uh, Alice uh, might have a business card that has the fingerprint and can do that comparison. But anecdotally we know that users rarely actually do that comparison. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of suggestions of maybe we could use a different kind of fingerprint and it would make them more likely to actually do that comparison. So there's a bunch of different fingerprints that have been proposed and these include fingerprints that instead of numbers have nonsense words or real words or made up poetry and then there's some that have actually graphical images so ASCII art or random art or even unicorns. And so we wondered, well, which of these is the best? Do any of these actually make it easier for users to successfully do that comparison? Now, we can imagine that we have an attacker who is going to try to fool the user by giving them a fingerprint that's close but not exactly the same as the real fingerprint. So is a user going to be able to spot that? There are a bunch of different ways the software might ask the user to make the comparison. One way is to simply show a picture of the fingerprint and ask the user to do the comparison and say same or different. Another approach is to make it multiple choice. The, the um, app might show you several fingerprints and you find the one that matches the one that you got on that business card. So what we want to know is which of these approaches is best. And so I'm showing you here an example of the unicorn and uh, you, you have to decide same or different. So take a look, can, can you tell whether that, that unicorn on the business card matches the unicorn um, in the app? Um, they're actually slightly different. So it's, it's hard to spot though. We did um, a Mechanical Turk study again here, so this was with over 600 participants. 
And uh, we gave them a role playing exercise. We told them to pretend that they were an accountant and they needed to um, update the social security numbers for 30 employees in a database. And so they had to exchange secure text messages with 30 different employees to get their social security numbers. Um, and um, we, we set this up so that one of them was actually simulating an attack. The other 29 were actually uh, correct. And so when they, when they saw the secure um, uh, text, they came with a fingerprint and they had to look and make that judgment. Uh, we tested five different text formats and three different graphic formats in our study. So this is what it looked like on each participant's computer screen. Um, on the left, you can see they've got the database and they've got their, their chat app and they've got a fingerprint. And on the right, it looks like a desk and it has business cards and their fingerprints on those business cards. And so each participant had to make that judgment 30 times. So what did we find? Well, the first thing we found is that people are really not very good at this. They made a lot of mistakes. They missed a lot of attacks. The uh, compare and select approach actually caused more mistakes than the compare and confirm approach. The text formats were all pretty similar. It doesn't really matter whether you use numbers or words. We had about the same error rate for all of them. The different graphical formats uh, varied more. Um, they were faster for participants, but some of them were really bad. Um, in particular, the unicorn was really, really bad. It was really hard for people to spot those errors. And in general, none of them performed very well. Um, so this tells us that if we are interested in really protecting against this type of attack, then just trying to you know, change whether we have words or numbers or unicorns or whatever in our fingerprint is actually not getting us very far. And we might want to really think about a different approach here rather than um, just playing around with unicorns in our crypto key fingerprints. Now let's look at some real non-security tasks that we have used in some of our user studies. So we did a bunch of user studies related to warnings and I'm sure you've all seen warnings like this pop up on your computer and they all say exactly this or at least most users think that they say exactly this. Uh, you don't actually need to read them and nobody does. Um, people just swat them away. So we wanted to know whether there was anything we could do to get users not to swat away all those warnings and to actually pay attention to them because sometimes they really are important. But we had this challenge. If we told people that we were doing a study about warnings, they would all pay attention to the warnings. So we couldn't tip them off that that's what we were actually interested in. Uh, we also needed to be able to expose them to risk or not and have it feel very natural. So we'll start with a study that we did evaluating phishing warnings in web browsers. This study was done back in 2007 and these are the uh, browser phishing warnings that were in the major browsers at the time. Uh, we tested these as well as some warnings that my students made up themselves. This was a study that required some deception. We invited people to our lab and we told them we were doing an online shopping study and we asked them to buy some paper clips on Amazon. Why paper clips? Because they're cheap and I could afford it in my study budget. After they purchased the paper clips, we gave them some questions about online shopping. These were actually questions from another study that someone in the business school was actually doing about online shopping. While they were doing their survey, that's when we fished them. We sent them an email to their email account that looked like it came from Amazon. Then we asked them to check their email to get the receipt for the paper clips so that we could reimburse them because they'd used their own credit card to buy those paper clips. And that's when they fell for the fish. So they would then click on the link in the email, that would pop up their web browser and it would trigger the warning. And then we could observe what happened and how they responded to that warning. This is what the phishing email looked like. The important point is that we had an urgent message that they had to do something right away and we had a link. And the link was not, we didn't do anything funny to the link. It's there in plain text, amazonaccounts.net. That's where you have to go. This was a very successful fish. Almost everybody fell for it. 
Um, and so we were able to then observe what we wanted to observe, which is what did they do when the warning popped up. And what we found is that depending on which warning they saw, they did very different things. Some of the warnings pretty much were universally ignored. Some of the warnings people did pay attention to. Um, so that was really interesting to see what characteristics of warnings made a difference and what did not. We also observed some interesting user behavior which helped us get at some of the root cause for why people were falling for these attacks. So for example, we found people were really confused by domain names. People thought amazonaccounts.net was a legit domain. It wasn't that they didn't read it, they read it, they thought it was legit. And we learned through this study that pe most people at the time were really not very good at understanding URLs, they couldn't parse a URL the way an expert would. And so the advice that experts give, oh just look at the URL, yeah they were looking at it, didn't mean anything to them. We also found some interesting confused mental models. Uh, one of the things we observed is we had some participants who, when that warning popped up, they closed their web browser, they went back to their email, they clicked on the link again, the web browser opened up, they closed it, they went back to their email, and they did this over and over and over again like seven or eight times. And then our study administrator said, uh, what, what do you think is happening here? And they said, well, you know, there's some problem with the website. And when there's a problem with the website, you just reload it and eventually the problem goes away. They had no concept that the problem might be related to the email itself or that it might be a security problem or anything like that. So that was an interesting observation. Uh, the good news is that our research actually led to improvement in warnings from some of the major web browsers um, as a result of the, of the study that we published. Okay, so um, last uh, study that I want to mention is uh, how to attract attention to key information in warnings. Now, uh, a little background here. Warnings are about hazards. And hazards, um, uh, some hazards are always dangerous. So you should never put your baby in a coffee maker. You should never drink poison and you should never go uh, walking around in hazardous mines. All right? These things will kill you. On the other hand, there are some hazards that are more contextual. Sometimes they're dangerous and sometimes they're not. So for example, drinking wine. Um, in many cases, it's not particularly hazardous to drink wine. But if you're about to go drive a car, why, that's pretty hazardous. Um, and if you're pregnant, you probably shouldn't drink too much wine. Fortunately, most of us know our situation. We know the context. We know if we're pregnant or if we're about to go drive a car, and we can then make an informed decision about whether or not to drink wine. With se computer security warnings, they are often uh, more like wine than poison. They are also contextual, but unfortunately, our users tend to not actually know what situation they're in. They don't know whether they are in a safe situation or not. And so we would like to develop warnings that actually helped users distinguish these safe situations from these unsafe situations. And when we do user studies of warnings, we'd really like to test both situations. So here's an example. Here are two warnings. One of them is in a safe situation and one is an unsafe situation. Uh, take a quick look and see if you can spot which is which. We find that experts are actually pretty good at this and they, they pretty quickly will tell us, oh, well obviously it's the publisher. I can see one of these publishers looks a little problematic. But when we show non-experts, they are much less likely to notice this quickly or if even at all. So my students wanted to figure out how can we attract users' attention to that key information that experts are using. Uh, and so they came up with a bunch of alternate warning designs that had kind of ugly um, contrasting colors. Um, they had animation. There were some where you had to actually swipe your mouse over the critical information before you could swat the warning away. And then there was one where you actually had to retype part of the warning in the box before you could proceed. So we wanted to know whether any of these work. And we needed a way that we could test lots and lots of these warnings, we actually had more that I didn't show you, with lots of people um, and in both those risky and benign conditions. 
Uh, so we needed to, uh, to develop a survey protocol that would let us do this. And we decided to use Mechanical Turk again. And this time we framed it as an online game study. We told people we were going to ask them to play a bunch of online games and review them for us. So they went and they played the game and they filled out a form and told us how much they liked it and how fun it was. They did this a few times. And then they got to a game where a warning popped up. And we varied which warning and whether it was benign or suspicious. Uh, so each person saw exactly one warning. And we were able to see what did they do when that warning popped up about a software download that the gaming site was asking them to do. So we had over 2,000 people do this. And we were able to see differences between conditions. Some of the warnings were more effective than others, um, both in preventing people from doing the malicious installs, as well as in making sure that people could still do the safe installs. Um, we found that swipe, type, and some of our delay conditions with animation were most effective. Um, but we were concerned because people only saw one warning. And some people said, you know, it was novel to see that one warning you've never seen before. What would happen if people saw this kind of warning all the time? And so we did another study where we exposed people multiple times, in some cases dozens of times, to warnings. And we found that some of our warnings were no longer good when people saw them a lot. Um, but the swipe and type warnings actually held up even to multiple exposures. So that was pretty interesting. All right, to wrap things up, we talked about three types of study designs that we've used successfully to observe uh, usable security, uh, observe usability and security. Um, so we looked at um, uh, observation of real world activity in the context of two factor authentication and home computer use. We looked at hypothetical security tasks in the concept of password policies and crypto key fingerprints. And we looked at real non-security tasks in the context of both phishing warnings and attracting users' attention um, in warnings as well. So some of the key takeaways that I want you to have. First of all, don't assume you know how humans will behave. Do a study. Next. If possible, observe real world activity. That's going to be your most realistic way to go. However, it's often not possible, in which case you should observe realistic scenarios under simulated risk. And I'd be happy to take a few questions. Do I want to come to the mic? There, there are mics in the, in the aisles. Anybody would like? Go, go to the, the mic right there. All right, so over there. Hi, uh, this was a really good study. I think it was very interesting. So yeah, we know the human behavior in general. Otherwise, we would not be having so many problems. You know, people always think on fishing lake, and people do not create a very strong password. So we know all this general behavior. Did you do any study on how we can change? I understand at the end you discussed you know, swiping and retyping the warning. But the malware and stuff, they're not going to give you all this animated, uh, very explicit warning that you're not click. They want you to click on those links, so they, they want them to get attacked. So um, do you observe or did you do any study on how can you change user's behavior so they don't do all this kind of things? Yeah, yeah. So, so we have um, we, we actually did one study looking at um, at kind of fake warnings that malware puts up and find that you know users do fall for them very easily. And I think part of that has to do with the types of warnings that our operating systems and browsers are putting up um, and the types of trust scenarios that they have. Um, that that it's actually really hard for users to distinguish a trustworthy user interface element from from a non-trustworthy element. And I think that's an open problem as to what to do about that. Okay. And the second question I have, like you said that you collect a lot of information from home users. Um, I don't know, you said like 50,000 plus or something, Windows users, like from their home. We, we have 200 Windows users. So 50,000 was, was our online study. Yeah. So for 200 of those people, how do you protect, uh, because that's a sensitive or I guess privacy related data, so how do you protect that data? 
Yeah, so we, we have actually a pretty extensive protocol so that we are, um, uh, first of all, not collecting everything. We, we collect a subset. Everything is immediately encrypted before it's even sent to our servers. Uh, it's re-encrypted on our servers. We have uh, strict access control policies. So yeah, we, we've thought a lot about that. Oh, thank you. Uh, over here. Yeah, have you done any studies on alert fatigue? You know, people just getting alert, alert, alert. Yes. Yes, yes we have. Um, as part of the series of warning studies, um, I mentioned we get, did a study where people were exposed dozens of times to an alert. And there was actually dozens, we did one where it was dozens of times within like five minutes. Um, and, uh, and, and we did, we did look at fatigue and we found fatigue is very, very high. However, um, the swipe and type approaches actually stand up even among those really kind of bizarre uh, alert fatigue conditions. Almost nothing else does. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm curious as to whether or not you've uh, done studies where you already have two-factor authentication, and then what, you, what you're looking at is the remembrance of a pin. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because that, you know, the, the notion of, of you know the base eight and base sixteen passwords is fair is fairly mundane these days. Yeah. In your study, simply one amongst many. Yeah. Uh, the more interesting study is is how uh, how users uh, formulate their pins and how that affects the over uh, the, the overall uh, security posture. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we haven't done that particular study, but it's a good question. Um, I think we are out of time, but I'm happy to talk with people offline afterwards. Thank you.